we are streaming now. Should I begin? Um, well, welcome, dear friends, uh, dear students, and dear colleagues. Welcome to day four of Habib's uh, Habib University's post-colonial higher education conference. Um, my name is Najib Jan. I am <clears throat> an associate professor here at Habib in the program for comparative critical post-humanities and will be serving as the chair of this panel. Um, I'm joined by the inimitable Dr. Noman Nakwi, who will be uh, one of our discussants today. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our panelists who of course need no introduction. It is of course convention to always introduce those who precisely need no introductions because after all we are <clears throat> of course in the business of paradoxes. Uh, Dr. Arvind Pal Esmander teaches at the University of Michigan, go blue where he has held the SBSC Endowed Chair in Sikh Studies. His research uh, <clears throat> crosses a wide range of academic disciplines, whilst his earlier work focused on the politics of secularism, religion making, and cultural translation in colonial and post-colonial South Asia. His recent research has shifted towards an understanding of the nature of cross-cultural philosophy or world philosophies in relation to decolonial praxis and diasporatic and diasporic modalities of self and knowing. Dr. Mander's earlier uh, books and works are too numerous uh, uh, to mention, but I'll, I'll definitely mention a couple, including the most well-received uh, recent uh, work, Religion and the Spectre of the West, Sikhism, India, Post-Coloniality and the Politics of Translation, which was published by Columbia in 2009, uh, Secularism and Religion Making with Marcus Dressler, and an introduction to Sikhism, a guide for the perplexed and numerous other works. Um, so we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Mandir speaking here today. Uh, Dr. Noor Sobers Khan, um, whose loss is still being dearly felt at Habib, is currently the director of the Arkham Documentation Center at MIT, an archive of Islamic art, visual culture, urbanism, and architecture. She was previously the lead curator for the South Asia collection at the British Library and curator of the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. Her research focuses on, early modernist, on the early modern Islamic world, the history and continued life of the Islamic dream interpretation practices, and how to turn these into AI oracles, which is absolutely fascinating. And I hope we get a sense of some of that work in your talk today. But um, before I hand it over, I'm wondering if I could just switch gears here. Before I... Um, before I hand it over to our guests, uh, for whom we can only offer appreciation for their gift of time and labor. Before I do that, I should honestly confess that I'm even more delighted, truly delighted in fact, that I do not bear the responsibility or task of presenting on today's thematic, repairing religions. Though being presented last, it is perhaps the most arduous, the most challenging, even the most risky, not merely because of its intense affect uh, and passion that it invokes, but precisely because it is truly a dreadful subject in terms of its demand on thinking, because of its proximity to finitude, to death, and to its ultimate ethical imperative of Gelassenheit or surrender, uh, letting go precisely of that which we most valorize and love in our time of simultaneous narcissism and abandonment. It is difficult because perhaps unlike some of the themes that uh, we saw in the past couple of days, the ecological, the political, and the economic, the religious, the very phenomena itself and its legitimacy is repeatedly called into question. Surely theology and God talk belong to the past. Surely to heal our economies, our planet, our polities and communities, we need to overcome our reliance on the foundational guarantee of a, trans of a transcendent being. In the calamitous ruins of our post-colonial present, the image of religion, its very signature seem to invoke the archaic justifications for mythic violence. And you know, we could go on and give plenty of current examples of that. Um, at its most sublime, it prefers a sense of the uncanny, of fear and trembling. How can that which abandons, which, whose presence is always hauntological, necessarily absent, absent, offer salvation for our imminent material crisis? What use beyond habit and comfort in the face of our imminence infinitude does the divine offer? And certainly, uh, we are increasingly anxious and weary of invoking the sacred as salvation after Agamben's exhaustive archaeology has, has revealed its proximity to both necks and rex, that is to both sovereignty and killability. 
And even when we gleefully respond to the vain conceits of liberal secular humanism by exposing the crypto theologies, the vengeful metaphysics that continue to undergird modernity's core categories, we do so perhaps with the suggestion that modernity's very lie, its very failure, its disavowal of its own political theology rests on an incomplete exorcism of, the, of, of transcendence. The entire enterprise then of repairing, rethinking religion and re, uh, not reinventing, but re-eventing religion, right? Re-eventing religion then is on par with the task of resurrection itself. And yet this very ontological turn may yet be the cipher that unlocks the mysteries of power and bring our contemporary biopolitical apparatus to a halt. And so with that very modest charge, uh, I will hand it over to, do we have a, a agreed upon order? Should we just go? Alphabetical is what we've been following. All right, so, so then. No, um, no will go first then. Let's, yeah. Oh, I thought um, Arvind was going first. If I can suggest actually that he does, because I feel like he'll speak more to the themes of the panel in a way that mine will kind of skirt sure. around and disrupt. Absolutely. So if, you, if you don't mind placing You both it. have to talk, so. I'm, I will. <laughs> All right, uh, so um, Ar Ar Arvind, why don't you go? And, uh, More than so. happy. Great, thank, thank you very you. much. So let me begin by thanking Professor Norman Nakvi for the invitation to contribute to this important conference and uh, this discussion about reparative futures. What I'm going to present is not really a formal paper. Um, I think the title of the, the, this panel made it very difficult for me to kind of do that. Instead, what I'm going to share with you is more akin to a fluid uh, toolbox of ideas, accompanied by a minimal narrative which offers hints and suggestions rather than a formal thesis. And it's also an invitation to the audience, the panelists, to try and connect with the concepts in their own way. Uh, but I will end with something like a, a, a kind of a manifesto for uh, reparative futures uh, as, as best I can. Now, although my invitational brief was to speak on religions, and I'm just going to share the screen um, and hopefully get the right one. Are you seeing this? Is, is this okay? Cool. Um, although my invitational brief was to speak on uh, religions, I have to admit that I feel a level of dissonance and tension whenever I'm asked to speak about the category of religion, even though I am by no means a secularist, as the political theorist William Connolly would say. And excuse me while I just get into this. So for me, um, religion is a problematic category. It's a term that's synonymous uh, with colonialism itself. In fact, I spent the first decade of my academic career, as, as Najib has mentioned, till uh, roughly 2009, severely critiquing the facile identification of my own tradition, Sikhism, and Sikh life worlds with religion and warning fellow Sikhs about the inherent problems of continuing to identify uncritically with the term. In an earlier phase of my research, I argued that the category of religion could not be separated from the spectral entity called the West and its intellectual apparatus. And that in alliance with other categories, it was responsible for um, the epistemic disempowerment of Sikh, Muslim, and Hindu modes of thought as these various cultures of the subcontinent were nationalized in the late 19th century or beginning in the late 19th century. So since 2011, my research has taken on a more consciously reparative dimension by returning to the field of global philosophies and cross-cultural thought which I find more conducive to epistemic empowerment. The desire to shift from historical disempowerment towards an empowering future is reflected in the title that I've chosen for this talk, Decolonizing Religion, Opening the Place of Thought. The implication here should be obvious, that to reach the place of thought, 
or empowerment, a necessary first step is to recognize religion as a vestige of colonialism. So my perspective on the question is uh, quite similar to the approach taken by a group of scholars, uh, amongst them uh, Timothy Fitzgerald, who popularized the statement uh, that I've just put up here, that religion is not a standalone category. And I'm going to roughly follow that. So a more accurate designation for, for the category that we call religion might be the religio-secular. And this is something that Marcus Dressler and I uh, argued in the volume that we co-edited, uh, Secularism and Religion Making, which is obviously, and, and the uh, religio-secular is obviously an allusion to the realization that's been sweeping scholarly and broadly intellectual circles in the last three decades that the terms religion and the secular, far from referring to anything universal, are in fact the product of a European Christian imaginary, its own self-understanding, and were imposed on the rest of the world through colonization in the 19th century. I'll come back to this later, but for now, let me just try to refocus my contribution um, to this conference theme repairing futures decolonial thought in the global ruins by reiterating that the plane of thought only opens up by dismantling the category religion, which I see as a key mechanism uh, in the engine of uh, colonialism and the, a key mechanism in the engine of Western supremacy. And just before I go on here, I'd like to stress that I'm talking about religion as a category here and not necessarily about what is implied in terms of life worlds, Islamic white life worlds, Sikh life worlds, Hindu life worlds, which I think are different from what the category itself uh, specifies. Now this refocusing is necessary because as I see it, the objective of decolonization is not just to recover the self, as Ashish Nandi would say, but, or to save cultures that have been eclipsed by almost three centuries of colonialism, but to enter the arena of global thought that European imperialism made possible. The need to enter the arena of global uh, thought is necessary even though the architecture of this arena which was such that it excluded and segregated and actually continues to exclude and segregate the concepts of colonized cultures even as they were assimilated into the imperial machine. So as an objective of decolonial thought, it's not just enough to be satisfied with the fact that there exists a field called post-colonial studies, uh, but rather to connect with and change the arena of global thought itself. And as a point of clarification, when I speak of thought, I don't mean the operations of logic or calculative reasoning, but a more expansive sense of an interconnected consciousness that includes the self, its relation to the world, and its relations to uh, existent and non-existent reality, whatever you want to call that. But here's the problem. It's not even clear whether we even have or are supposed to have access to this plane of thought. This might sound like a ridiculous question, and for some of you, it may have resonances with Hamid Dabashi's uh, book from 2015 uh, titled Can Non-Europeans Think, which basically addressed the Eurocentric preju uh, prejudice perpetrated by Slavo Zizek, amongst others, that thinking and philosophy only happened in Europe or in the West, and, that, uh, and the claim that global thought itself is an exclusive European property. And this is not a trivial matter, not least because the legacy of colonialism continues to haunt the plane of thought, even through fields like post-colonial studies. And I'm just making a quick reference here to something that Derrida said. I haven't done Derrida for years now, but Spivak has also mentioned this, that the way that post-colonial studies has developed in the last uh, 20 years at least is not how it was, it may have been originally envisaged, uh, that it's kind of taken on a life of its own. But anyway, I won't say much more uh, about that. But 
What I am saying is that decolonization at the level of thought has not properly happened. Yes, we see glimpses of it, but it has not yet touched Western consciousness in a deep and sustained way. And the reason for this resides in the architecture of the arena of global thought, an architecture that not only remains deeply imperialistic, but also has something to do with the uniqueness of European colonialism. I mention this uh, because unlike other forms of imperialism, European colonization of the world was unique in at least two important ways. Apart from its tangible apparatus, and here one could refer to economic capitalism, to science and technology, or the military machine uh, of, of Europe and the West, European colonization imposed a new time consciousness. And through this was able to also impose a new mode of sovereignty that the Columbia scholar Wael Halak has called epistemic sovereignty. The new time consciousness of modernity not only made colonized peoples forget that they had entered a new time consciousness, but more insidiously, it made them forget that they had forgotten. To forget that one has forgotten means to lose memory or to lose sight of the playing field on which thought is actually happening. In other words, one's ability to think freely, to make connections between concepts in a sovereign manner is now replaced by the function of epistemic sovereignty, which in alliance with a new apparatus of power, namely the uh, European academic knowledge machine, propagated what Gilles Deleuze has termed the dogmatic image of thought that is specific to European philosophy and theology. And together, this new epistemic machinery altered the mindset of the colonized by rewiring it to the past, thereby affecting its capacity to focus on the future or to see its own future thereby interdicting the ability of natives to use the categories of their own life worlds and to make the future um, according to their uh, life worlds. In other words, it changed the playing field on which we all stand. It changed the sense of reality itself. The future could only be made by acknowledging the fundamental marker of reality, namely modernity which brought with it its uh, peculiar time consciousness. I'll come back to this later if I can, but basically all I'm saying is that it altered the conceptual ground upon which encounter between colonized and colonizer took place and also any future encounters. In order for there to be a reparative future, it's therefore necessary to understand the mechanisms by which indigenous categories were displaced by the category of religion so that they can play a positive role in global thought. And um, this, this really is all about uh, establishing a, uh, a new playing field for encounters. And what I'm gonna move to fairly soon is, is uh, to talk about reclaiming this epistemic machinery. But, before I do that, let me just make reference to um, why the religious secular is so problematic and, and just stay with this for about five minutes before we, we kind of move on. But to get to this point, to the point of the place of thought that I'm kind of gesturing towards, um, it's, it's important to recognize that A, religio, the religious secular is a problematic category because it debilitates Western, uh, non-Western modes of thought. It has been instrumental in creating an unequal playing field for cultures to encounter each other during the colonial period. And it leaves a legacy that we're still having to deal with. And I'd like to make reference here to an important and influential body of scholarship, which is uh, recognized more or less as a branch of religious studies, but intersects with many other fields which is called critical religion or critical religious studies, which is now three decades old and has accumulated a very substantial body of uh, research and important literature. And the field itself is associated with some pretty famous names, uh, Jonathan Z. Smith, S. N. Bala Gangadhara, uh, Talal Asad, 
uh, Sabah Mahmoud, um, Timothy Fitzgerald, Tomoko Masuzawa, and I could mention a whole host of others. These are just some of the primary people who have pushed uh, critical religion, and there's a, an army of scholars behind this as well. Now, if there is a set of ideas around which this body of scholarship converges, uh, they can be summarized in the following way. So these are some postulates, some very broad postulates of the field called critical religion. And this is, in a sense, the stance that I'm taking as well. And by taking this stance, it allows me to connect to um, the, the, the other fields that I've been talking about. So for one thing, the category religion does not refer to something natural. It has no consistent referent. The idea that religion is something fundamental to human experience, history, culture, beliefs, and practices has been challenged and effectively debunked by scholars across the board. So religion is not uh, universal either. It's not transhistorical, transcultural, or essentially interior. And it's interesting that a lot of Catholic scholars are arguing precisely this as well, which is pointing to the Protestant um, fabrication of the category religion in this, uh, in this way. Rather, the belief in religion as a universal category is the result over three centuries of active construction coinciding with European colonialism, whereby scholars, administrators, politicians identified phenomena that were deemed religious or categorized as religious and then separated these same phenomena from ostensibly secular objects or phenomena. This construction in turn points to a particular configuration of power, namely the emergence of the modern liberal state paralleled by the invention of the peculiarly modern category religion. Over three centuries, um, the, in which the modern secular state develops, we see the expansion of the term religion, beginning with a 16th century emphasis on establishing Christian truth by excluding non-Christian others, to in the 18th century, the inclusion of non-Christian others, um, and then in the early 19th century, to a wholesale pluralization of the term religions. The point here is that the establishment of religion in the singular and religions in the plural takes effect when early modern European states are busy redefining the nature of sovereignty in relation to the church and simultaneously expanding empire using the category religion as an essential tool of the colonial machinery. So sovereignty is now redefined epistemically and politically. Epistemically, uh, I'm using it uh, in a variety of senses, but essentially to, to suggest the autonomy of humanistic knowledge, um, the rise of the, the kind of human representational subject, uh, and which, which is in a position of domination over nature, over the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And politically, of course, to signify um, territorial nationhood. In short, both in Europe and in the colonies, religion became an, an essential tool of governance and sovereignty. And here I'm taking this term from this phrase from the recent volume by Trevor Stack, uh, Naomi Goldenberg and Tim Fitzgerald, uh, religion as a category of governance and sovereignty. And with that, I'd like to just put up this uh, so when I learned that I had 20 to 25 minutes, I panicked and I, I thought there's no way I can write a paper uh, in this amount of time. So I've reduced it to, <laughs> to these schemas. So apologies if there's, this is a bit comical, but anyway, it, it has some purpose to it, which I'll try to explain. So I'm trying to get across the interconnection of this conceptual apparatus here. So we, um, I've just mentioned the re religious secularism as a tool for governance and sovereignty. Um, it's part of the state uh, or colonial state machinery. And there are two wings to it, two ways 
in which it's working, namely epistemic sovereignty and political sovereignty. And we've we've just talked about this. But epistemic sovereignty is essentially uh, constructed through the work of travelers, missionaries, orientalists, administrators, etc., cetera, um, and feeds into um, what might be called the comparative imaginary of the West. It, it helps to create this conceptual apparatus. Um, so what epistemic sovereignty does is to create dominant systematic descriptions of Asian, African, uh, whatever culture, to reproduce that knowledge of Asia and Africa, which in turn helps colonial governments to consolidate power. And in doing that also helps to flesh out nationalized identities, both the identity of Europe and Europeans, but at the same time, the identity of those who are colonized as well. And much of this you've probably read in the works of uh, Bernard Cohn and uh, Nick Dirks and many other scholars, but I'm trying to just bring it together in different ways. And, and the recent book by uh, Vail Halak, I thought was really fascinating in helping to do this, but I'm also bringing together stuff that I've done from the past, my own work in religion and the spectre of the West. Um, and central to this, is the creation of this comparative imaginary of the West. And um, emblematic of this, I think, is the work of Hegel. Um, and, and remember, this is happening at the, at the level of thought. So epistemic sovereignty also refers to that arena of global thought, which is kind of being manufactured at this time. Now, Hegel created this, uh, these schemas of world systems, so world religions, world literatures, world philosophies, world history, et cetera, et cetera. And what's, what's really interesting is how the figure of the world comes about at this time. The, world, the, 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 the very idea of world and the way it's being used uh, is a figure of domination, but also a figure of pluralism, a figure of plurality or an attempt to uh, take the multiplicity of cultures which are being colonized and to um, shunt them through the kind of unity that's being foisted on them by uh, European philosophy. Um, and this figure of the world also helps to map uh, the differences between different cultures. And, and I'll, we'll, we'll see that in the, the next slide. So it creates a kind of global epistemology, if you like. And the mechanism for this is through the work of translation or translatology. Um, when I use the word translatology, it's, it's again, I'm using both Laruel and uh, Derrida here uh, who use it in different ways, but it essentially means uh, a technology of translation and emphasis on the word technology here, which is very, very important, which helps to mediate encounters between the colonized and the coloni colonizer. So the next slide is, is essentially what's been happening here, but uh, just expanding on the translatology aspect, and I've used the word, uh, the, the, the term here, machine of political theology, to describe this. So again, we're looking at the way that epistemic sovereignty works and how translatology works. And again, this is, uh, what I'm trying to get across here is the way that it all kind of fits together that epistemic sovereignty um, is the way that this apparatus works as a system of power, but it has, um, it has internal mechanisms and that eternal me internal mechanism is what Esposito has recently called the machine of political theology. So holding it together and, and making it work is the work of political theology. And I, I found Esposito's work really fascinating because it helped me to kind of crystallize ideas that I couldn't sort of put together in, in my last work, Religion of the Spectre of the West. And in a sense, it also tells, uh, it, uh, the machine of political theology is in, in essence, the spirit or the spectre of the West that does the work, disappears, comes back, etc., but also holds these kind of activities together um, maps, uh, so it maps uh, fields of knowledge and encounter between the West and the non-West. It pr produces 
planes of encounter, essentially as non-encounter, where the concepts of different cultures actually don't contact or intermingle. And, and just by saying this, I am reducing an entire book I've just written into one line, which I'm, I'm trying to explain why after, after this global arena of thought has kind of come in, why, cult, why the concepts of different cultures never actually are allowed to contact. Um, why it's always the European concept that stands in the place um, to speak on behalf of uh, other uh, concepts. There's a lot going on behind that that I won't go into here, but essentially all of this is this segregation of cultures in terms of race, religion, civilization, and especially thought. I think thought is the essential thing that I'm pointing out here is internalized by the native elites and then leads to an interdiction of their own kind of life worlds, their own uh, conceptual um, forms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I have to be honest, um, we've put this diagram together in the last couple of days and it could be put together in many different ways, but this is how it is for the time being and it might change as I, uh, do the revisions to the book. Um, but I'm just going to go from here to the last slide. Oh, I should have homed in on these. I'm sorry. But I'm just going to go to the last slide because time is kind of moving on. And I don't know how to do this, but there we go towards a reparative manifesto. So what, what can I, what's to take away from this? First of all, I think uh, I would recommend a wholesale kind of activism in the field, in, in all different fields, but with the aim of occupying thought itself. I'm not quite sure what I mean by that. Um, it, 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 you know, I, it's more of a, a gesture that I'm making, but what I'm, what I'm getting at, and I'm working in the field of philosophy here and world philosophies, is that we need to take apart the, the frameworks in which philosophy has kind of operated. And there's been a lot of debate about the kind of um, the, the white supremacist um, sort of uh, underpinnings of Western conceptuality from Kant onwards and even before. Um, so Occupy Thought itself, we can't afford not to occupy thought. Um, and if that means an engagement with philosophy, even though we may not be in philosophy departments and I'm in a department of Asian languages and cultures, nevertheless, that uh, engagement is absolutely essential. Secondly, reclaim the, uh, reclaim epistemic sovereignty. Um, so I problematized it by using Deleuze's idea that the way thought works is very dogmatic. And this is obviously Deleuze's, uh, it's a very important term here because he's not just pointing to the secular uh, formation of representational thought, but telling us that it's dogmatic because it has theological underpinnings. Now, a lot of other philosophers have said something similar, but in my view, very few people have got really close to it in the way that Deleuze has. So it's the dogmatic image of thought. Another word for it might be onto theology, but I don't think onto theology does the same kind of work. And Esposito has, has really hit the nail on the head with his term, machine of political theology. So I think, I think there is a really interesting convergence between these different um, thinkers, uh, Esposito, Deleuze, and of course I'm taking epistemic sovereignty from Halak's recent work, and they, they work really nicely together. So reclaim epistemic sovereignty. Uh, third one, reprogram the matrix. So we're in the belly of the beast. It has to be reprogrammed from within. You cannot attack this machine from the outside. It has to work from the inside. Um, and I ended my last book, uh, Religion in the Spectre of the West by saying that, you know, these kind of moves would only be made when geopolitical shifts happened, right? 
um, I've, I've kind of pulled back from that. So in the absence of seismic geopolitical shifts, we nevertheless have to activate ways of doing this, ways of um, reprogramming, rewiring uh, the plane of thought from within uh, I, I, Western philosophy, if, if that means anything. And the way I'm doing it in my uh, next book is to create new images of thought, both from within the life worlds that we're living in, from previously colonized cultures using texts, scriptural texts, etc. But I'm I'm also using this term diaspora, uh, and diasporicity in a in a I think in a in a relatively new way, although it's been used uh, before. It's a way of um, it's a way of saying that the plane of encounter is happening at the level of affect, uh, and I'm not saying this right, I'm already failing in the way I'm saying this, but I take myself as, a, as an example. I'm the product of uh, European, Western, British culture, and also of Indian culture as well. I'm Sikh, I'm Punjabi, whatever. And in the, in the early 90s, there was a lot of work on hybridity and, you know, Homi Baba, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think he really got at where this hybridization was happening. And that's what I'm indicating by this term diasporicity. It's happening at the level of affect. And it, it, it's basically, um, yeah, again, I'm failing to, to pinpoint this. But a result of this, and maybe I'll talk about this in the uh, in, in the Q and A. But a result of this is to diasporize philosophy itself, to 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 try and understand philosophy, to reclaim it, and uh, show that it also is a product of diasporicity, etc. And I'm doing a lot of this work in uh, my forthcoming book, uh, Geopolitical Encounters. So I'm I'm going to leave it there. Otherwise, I'm going to get all sort of fuzzy and, and hazy. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. I was muted. Um, thank you so much for that very, very stimulating and uh, uh, really enormously suggestive uh, talk. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and uh, follow-ups in our, in our Q&A, but um, let me turn now to uh, Dr. Sobris Khan. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, first, thank you so much, Arvind, for that paper. That was really uh, wonderful. I enjoyed every minute of it. And um, I think I was right to uh, uh, force you to go first because it provided a very nice theoretical framework for um, two projects that I am working on now that are brand new. I'm, I'm in the midst of developing them. So I'm going to have to ask for the patience of my um, fellow panelists and colleagues and audience as I talk through them. Um, and also while I switch through different presentations and PowerPoints and images. Um, but I think that the two projects will speak very nicely to the questions that were raised um, in, in your paper actually. I would say the first project I'm working on speaks to the question of, it actually illuminates and, and puts its finger on the material mechanisms by which indigenous categories and Muslim life worlds were displaced, right? So I'm, you know, just to give you a bit of background to me, I'm, I'm a manuscript curator and a cultural heritage worker, a memory worker, if you will. Um, and so, you know, what I work with are, 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 are physical materials. So that's my first project is actually you know, pointing to where and how the colonial violence destroyed Muslim life worlds in uh, colonial South Asia. Um, and, you know, the reason why I'm, I'm working on Islam is just because that's my background. I'm sure you could do a very similar study for, for Sikhism and, and Sikh life worlds as well. Um, and the second project that I'm working on, and so the first project is a very traditional manuscript, you know, sort of historical philology based project. The second one, um, I hope, is an example of how uh, I am, I and a group of colleagues are trying to reclaim the epistemic machinery of the Muslim life worlds that were 
uh, destroyed by uh, colonial violence. And I found so fascinating your uh, kind of encouragement to, to rewire the machine from within itself, because that's really what this project is trying to do on a, on a technological scale, basically to recapture kind of the, the, the pre-modern Muslim epistemic landscape, but translate it into like futurological art that is art that actually intervenes in reality to change it on a technological level. Um, so I hope that this project speaks to some of those aims that you outlined in your, uh, in your talk. That being said, both projects are very, very, very preliminary. The first one is a draft of an article that I've you know, sent off into the abyss to be peer reviewed and has not yet come back to me. And the other one is in the form of uh, two artificial intelligence neural networks that um, I'm literally texting with the developers now to see if I can launch it live, but I don't think we'll be able to today. So they're very nascent, very new projects. So you know, any input uh, you have, uh, I'm, I'm very, very open to it. So let me just share my screen so that I can show you some imagery from the first project that I want to talk about, which is really a project dealing with the question of colonial epistemicide and um, locating the, the moments when it happened, right? Not just a process as such or a theoretical abstract process, but who did it and how and when and how did it come about and where are the ruins of it now? Um, so let me see if I can, and I should just say, you know, there would be absolutely no way I could kind of have said this were I still working for the British Library, so. <laughs> okay, let me um, see if I can share my screen. And I always have this problem because I'm working on two screens. So, um, Bear with me one moment. And if you can just let me know if uh, you can see a, yes, you can see a presentation. Okay, excellent. I am actually just going to leave it in uh, the draft form as it is. I'm not gonna enter into the slideshow. And the reason for that is that when I do that, the uh, you, you disappear from my screen and I can no longer see you. Um, so this project, the first research project that I, I'm going to talk about, um, began during my time when I was working at the British Library as the head of the South Asia Collections. Um, where, where to start? Um, that's a story and a half in of itself. But um, this collection uh, is called the Delhi Collection and uh, that I'm going to talk about today. It's a corpus of manuscripts um, housed in the British Library. Uh, originally part of the India Office Library. Um, you can see the numbers here. It's roughly 2,500 volumes of material in Arabic, Persian, Urdu, smattering of Turkish as well. Um, it is has, in the historiography around it, been purported to be the, uh, not my words, imperial library of the Mughal court. Um, however, the material itself has been not really accessible to scholars. Um, it was described in handwritten notes by you know, some very eminent Orientalists of the early 20th century, um, but those notes were not really made available until um, publicly uh, on the internet until 2012, uh, when I got a grant from the Better Cat Trust, so many thanks to them, uh, to digitize those notes and put them online. That was kind of the first time that there was mass access to this material, to these 2,500 manuscripts. 2,500 volumes, I should say. Each volume contains anywhere from one to 10 titles, right? So it's a huge, uh, you know, sort of encyclopedia of pre-modern Islamic intellectual culture. Like it basically is, you know, the life world of the Muslim intellectuals of its time. Um, and I'll go through the presentation and give you a bit of a sense of what's in this collection. So, you know, the way that this was presented to the public is it, it's the Mughal Imperial Library. Um, and uh, I was asked by a colleague to look at the um, scribal annotations and colophons in this collection. Um, so as I went through, um, it became, and other scholars have come to a similar uh, conclusion who worked closely with this collection. 
um, and I'm hoping to put together a wider project uh, to work together with them. But as you as you go through the the physical material of these manuscripts, and and you know, just to give you a sense, physically they they take up a lot of space. I mean, several bays of shelves in the basement of the library are occupied just by this collection. Like it's it's the the the, the mass of it is I think important to emphasize, right? Um, as you go through physically looking through this collection, it becomes immediately apparent that while there might be some manuscripts in there that are of a courtly uh, production, most of them are not. Most of them seem to be the results of um, Muslim intellectuals living in and around Delhi or North India um, at the time when this collection was, was created or was sort of brought into being which I should mention is 1857. So this collection was basically, um, I forget what the original mythology of it is. I believe that um, uh, the, the mythology in the kind of textbook colonial historiography of it is that it was looted, not said by whom, during the uprising in 1857, and the British then uh, purchased it from the looters in order to maintain its integrity as a collection, took it to Calcutta and then from Calcutta to London. That, that I believe was the, the kind of mythology around what happened. If you look at the actual materials though, uh, it becomes immediately apparent that it's, it's a range of different um, private, libraries and, and lesser known scholars from around in and around the middle of the 19th century. So around 1857 scholars who were intellectually active, Muslim scholars who were intellectually active during that period. It's their personal libraries primarily. Um, so it's not at all the Mughal library. Um, and as you delve deeper and deeper into who did these manuscripts belong to, what kind of intellectual milieu were they a part of, um, and I can give you some examples here. Um, you know, you, you encounter the names of scholars, uh, many of whom were associated with uh, Shah Wali Allah and the Madrasa Rahimiya and, you know, sort of Shah Wali Allah's descendants and family and their wider network throughout the North of India, who were of course involved in anti-colonial resistance. And of course, as you know, the Madrasa Rahimiya was, was raised and, and flattened in, in you know, um, 1857, as were, uh, you know, large parts of, of Old Delhi. I don't need to tell this audience that. Um, but what's fascinating is that what you find in this collection, and I can just quickly go through what I found anyway, um, because I was looking for scribal annotations and trying to trace questions of, of sort of, you know, reconstructing the scholarly library of you know, basically the, the life world of a Muslim scholar living in Delhi in and around 1857, I focused in on one particular uh, not very well-known scholar named Karim Allah ibn Lutfullah, um, who was associated with the intellectual milieu of the, Madr of the Madrasa Rahimiya and managed to find about 20 manuscripts um, either authored by him or written in his hand, which is significant, like that's a big uh, chunk of, of material. Um, and he was not part of the Mughal court. He was just a, a minor, um, significant, but you know, minor uh, Muslim intellectual figure in his day. And so you go through and you see, you know, everything from uh, treatises that he wrote um, on grammar. Uh, here's a treatise he wrote for his son. It's very touching, actually, named after his son on Arabic grammar. Um, uh, you know, copies of Arabic poetry that he made. Um, the Qisas al-Anbiya, so the stories of the prophets that he copied, um, histories of Mahmud of Bazna, um, so the Hakka al which deals with the soul, the afterlife, the body and the grave, um, and so on and so forth, commentaries on logic, basically the, the, the foundational works that you would need to study in um, a madrasa in the you know, uh, first half of the 19th century. Now, what's interesting about this collection, and I'm, I'm really summarizing here, I'll just, these are the, some of the images just to give you a sense of what it looks like. And, you know, if you have any familiarity with Mughal courtly production, this is not what it looks like. I mean, I think even someone who is not uh, sort of versed in the intricacies of uh, South Asian manuscript production can look at this and say, well, yes, this looks like a scholar's working copy of a manuscript, not something produced at the Mughal court. 
um, the imperial Mughal library, as it were. Um, so anyway, you get a sense of his output. And these are all things that I found just from this one small scholar within this wider you know, uh, collection uh, of manuscripts. Um, I mean, I think there's enough in here for several lifetimes of, of PhD work to kind of unpick whose libraries were looted, whose libraries did the British loot? Where are their descendants for that matter, right? Because Karim Alab survived uh, 1857 and, and went on and produced other works and, and you know, had a family. Um, and yet his entire library is entombed in the basement of, uh, you know, the BL in London. Um, so, you know, just speaking of this question of um, reparative religion, it obviously immediately brought to mind to me the question of reparations in very straightforward terms. Um, so I, I bring this up because, you know, as one goes through the material reality and the physical weight of the fact that what seems to have happened in 1857 is not just you know economic destruction social destruction it was also the devastation of an intellectual landscape and uh, and a life world as well and we say that right we say that in abstract terms but what does it mean physically physically it means that 2500 manuscripts were intentionally removed in order to devastate the anti-colonial Muslim intellectual networks that were working against the British in 1857. And those artifacts still exist uh, hidden away uh, in many respects. Like I would say that research on this material it hasn't been discouraged as such. You can go to the library and request these manuscripts, but how do you find them? How do you know they're there? There's no finding aid. You know, they're not online, they're not in a catalog, um, you know, you sort of already have to be in the know in order to even know that they exist and that they're there. And I would think that the reason for that is, is this very problematic history that they bear very eloquent witness to. So um, I also think that this whole scale removal of the the, you know, the, the physical means by which um, a Muslim intellectual in Delhi would ply his trade and would pass on knowledge and would teach and would, would create, you know, um, uh, you know would, would, would perpetuate the knowledge systems that he uh, existed in was through these artifacts themselves, right, through copying, through sharing, through circulating. And the fact that they are taken en masse and placed uh, in a location that is entirely inaccessible uh, to the people who produced them, um, to me is a, a material example of, of epistemicide that I think needs to be um, highlighted. So that is one project that I'm currently working on and uh, would be lovely to actually talk more with you about this and how to conceptualize it and how to you know, think about the implications of kind of what, um, you know, what happened. Like I, think that the rise of certain forms of Islamic reformism are due to the removal of some of this material. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like that line of inquiry needs to be pursued a bit more. Um, and I've discussed it with a few other scholars who work on this, but as you know, I'm very much a 16th century rather than a 19th century scholar. So that I believe, um, speaks to this question of the mechanisms by which uh, colonial epistemicide happened, basically. Um, you have a very, uh, I mean, and for me, it was, it was kind of astonishing as, uh, you know, a descendant, I mean, a very poor descendant, but a descendant of this culture um, to be faced with its destruction by preserving and entombing it in an elite institution that would otherwise be unreachable. I mean, it, the, the whole process, the whole historical process by which that happened was so insidious and so uh, openly done that to me it was, it, it, you know, it left me aghast uh, on a moral level. But anyway, um, my second project that I want to talk about. So, I mean, I think it's important to document this, right? But we obviously can't leave the question there of like, oh, you know, the, the damage of, of removing, you know, these, this material from the north of India devastated Muslim life worlds for the past two and a half centuries. And we leave it there. I, I would disagree with that. So my other project that I'm working on right now um, is a, a kind of reclaiming of this epistemic machinery, but um, 
you know, hopefully without falling into this trap of, uh, of, of sort of reifying or reinscribing colonial uh, understandings of what religion is as such. Um, and so I'm using for my conceptual framework, the notion of Islamic dream interpretation. Um, and I should just briefly mention that I think this project is a great example of the way that decolonial pedagogy can give rise to uh, art as research, because the idea for this project emerged out of a course I taught at Habib University in 2019 um, called, uh, I think I called it a decolonial history of dream interpretation or something like this. And, um, and it was uh, basically the purpose of this course, um, you know, at the time, and you know, you guys might have changed this since I was there, but the CLS program had this principle of comparative hermeneutics, whereby students are engaged to bring different intellectual frameworks and interpretive frameworks into conversation. Um, and so my aim with this course was to do that, was to take Islamic dream interpretation texts and put them in conversation with, you know, um, various other traditions, again, without attempting, without attempting to kind of essentialize those other traditions, right? Um, and the ultimate goal was to decenter Western analytical approaches to dream interpretation, right? Western psychoanalytical approaches to dream interpretation with the ultimate goal of actually taking the students beyond any textual engagement, right? So now you've sort of reintroduced them to the Islamic intellectual history, but then the next step after that is to show them that actually you don't need a text because you yourself are the source of theory and, and a conceptual framework within your own ability to dream and interpret your dreams. Not just you, but your aunties, your grandmother, your friend, you know, maybe someone who doesn't have access to a text, right? They themselves are a source of theorizing, right? We don't have to nod to Freud or even Al-Ghazali, right? You're a source of theory yourself. So that was kind of the aim of the, the, the kind of decolonial pedagogy of the course and the students had to keep a dream diary. Um, you know, how successful I was in my aims, you would really just have to ask the poor students who were subjected to this experience. Um, I think some of them enjoyed it. Uh, I hope it was interesting for them. They got to interpret dreams and interpret each other's dreams. And um, so anyway, what emerged out of that project is now uh, something that I guess I can only describe as, as a project in Muslim futurology. And uh, let me share my screen again so you can kind of see. Well, I'll share it at the end because the website is still very much in draft form. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of this project, and I would love to actually have your input on how to conceptualize the notion of who is a Muslim in this project, right? <laughs> you know, because um, again, one doesn't want to essentialize and reify these, these, these notions. So what I've been describing this project as um, is it's a reality creating kind of ontologically generative uh, conceptual art project. And it consists of two art artificial intelligence neural networks, one that interprets dreams and the dream interpreter has been trained um, on texts uh, of dream interpretation written by Ibn Sirin and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq and a, a smattering of other ones. Um, and then the dream generator has been trained or is being trained on human dreams. So eventually what will happen is that the AI dreamer will be able to dream and the dream interpreter will be able to interpret. However, they require human input, right? Like in order to develop the interpreter, humans need to give the interpreter their dreams. And then the interpretation becomes more sophisticated in order for the dream generator to generate dreams people need to share their dreams with it. So there's like this recursive project of, of input and output, whereby, you know, you sort of become an assemblage with the uh, artificial intelligence neural networks. And so I'm uh, calling this an onto technological ummatic assemblage, because it's an assemblage of the ummah with technology creating a new ontological uh, situation. So that's the aim. Um, you know, what, what happens with this is anyone's guess, right? It's not live yet. Um, I've presented it in a few different forums um, and people either seem to be fascinated by it or, or wondering if I'm okay. Um, the other thing I would uh, say that this project does a couple of things. One is that 
you know, using, I'm, I'm really seeing this as an oracle of like a Muslim future whereby we are the ones who are interfering in technological algorithms through our dream world um, to do things like in reality, change algorithms and confuse algorithms. So this is obviously also a critique of uh, surveillance capitalism and surveillance technology as well, right? We're appropriating tools that are generally used against us in order to uh, confuse and modify them. We're using them for purposes that they're not made for, right? No, no, no profit can come out of this. No sense can be made of it in, you know, in, in a utilitarian fashion. The other thing that this is, is um, appropriating artificial intelligence technologies as a new divinatory tool for glimpsing into the rave, right? For seeing into the future. So it's also an appropriation of technologies um, that are often used against the global Muslim community both in the diaspora and in Muslim majority countries. So it's an appropriation of those tools for our, our own purposes that defy sort of capitalist logic. Um, so it's doing a, a couple of different things. Um, you know, as you can probably tell, I'm sort of relying on Deleuzian notions of, of you know, sort of uh, rhizomatic decentralized proliferating systems and, um, you know, this notion that, uh, you know, there will be a constant state of flux between, um, you know, and going back to Arvind's idea of diasporizing philosophies, there's a constant flux between like the diaspora entering their dreams in you know, sort of Muslims all over the world entering their dreams and these dreams being interpreted, put out, influencing the reality of algorithms. Um, and then, you know, that entering back into you. So it really is a, a constant sort of flux of, of this constantly changing assemblage. So that's what I'm aiming to do in this project. I'll just share the, the website with you. You can have a look at the draft site now. Um, let me see if there's anything I missed. Oh yeah, and it's obviously also a commentary on things like, um, you know, anthropological research to understand like the, you know, the mind of the Muslim or the psyche of the Muslim. This is, you know, clearly a tongue in cheek commentary on that. Um, and uh, yes, let's see what else. I have a lot of very messy notes here. Oh, it's also a critique of, um, of a notion of like agentive subjectivity, right? The, the notion that well, two, there's sort of two things. One is that I feel that the idea of like the Muslim is often a, a site where like, you know, kind of mainstream media project notions of the pre-modern Western self onto the Muslim, right? So we're excluded from that form of subjectivity that renders you human anyway, right? Being an agent, being objective, being universal, being modern, being in, you know, being able to be in the future. So we're excluded from that anyway. So what this sort of collectivized project does is, is deconstruct that to begin with, right? Um, so that's also an important aspect of this. Um, and then let me just go through my very messy notes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically just a disruptive, um, hopefully fun project that will, uh, you know, not get me arrested or anything. So let me um, open the other, let me share my screen. I'll give you a little tour of the site as it exists now. And I was hoping to actually launch it today. And maybe, you know, if some of my former students are here, they, they're welcome to enter their dreams in, because um, poor things, I made them keep very extensive dream diaries. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, can you see this? Yeah, okay, so this is, um, and the imagery, uh, it's taken, so the imagery is also very interesting. It's taken from kind of Urdu language, uh, divination lithographs that sort of emerge out of the manuscript culture, but then get kind of mixed in as a pastiche with, um, you know, other print culture that's circulating in South Asia in the 19th century. So that's where the, the images are from. So I'm actually going to change the title from this dream does not exist to Muslims are in the future too. So this is a this is a very uh, sort of early version of this site. But um, there's a bit of a background that will hopefully oh, is this even working? Oh, there we go. Um, that gives a bit of information about the history of dream interpretation in the Islamic world. Again, just because you know, although, you know, one is not trying to, to essentialize or reify these uh, intellectual traditions, they do exist and they do form the basis of, I mean, they do inform the way this project has, has taken shape. 
Um, there's a concept note, and this is where I talk a bit about, um, you know, why we're doing this and, and, you know, about how it's a disruptive technology, how it's this futurological, you know, onto technological reality making uh, project. Um, and then this lays out the actual stages. So we're about to launch the actual interpreter. The next stage will be collecting dreams. So I'll be pestering all of my friends and colleagues across the world to give me their dreams. Um, and then, then we'll be able to generate dreams. And then the actual Oracle will come into being, right? Where the two AIs can speak to each other. Um, and so there will be space for that, for you to enter those. Um, there's a bit of a bibliography for those who are interested. And then there's a team of us working on this, I should say. I am obviously not a computer scientist myself, so I'm very, very, very grateful to a team of friends who have stepped in to help develop this project based in Lahore. So Bilal Sami, Ali Aziz, Mahboub Mustafa, and Nazakat Ali are the brains behind the actual AI and the back end of the project. So huge thanks to them. I'm not sure they appreciate what they've quite gotten themselves into, but um, you know, huge thanks to their technical expertise and efforts. So that's the project that I'm working on now. Um, because it's not live yet, um, I don't actually know how it's going to be received. You know, <laughs> will it will it will it gain approval? Will it be provocative? Will it cause you know uh, consternation? Um, you know, will will uh, any anything really can happen with it? Um, but I guess that remains to be seen. But I do hope that it is attempting to reclaim some epistemic machinery um, to recreate a, a landscape of Muslim life worlds that allow us to kind of appropriate technology. Um, and, you know, and do hopefully what Arvind is saying. I mean, he was speaking in reference to philosophy when he said, I think, intervene in the machine from the inside. I'm literally talking about machines. Like, I would like to intervene in machines and, uh, and, and, and you know, turn them into Muslim life worlds, basically. Um, so that's my goal these days. And I'll stop there. I probably have gotten uh, used up my time, I would think. Najib, Noman, are you are you uh, uh, speechless? We are here. We are, we are, I'm trying to decide whether I've taken the red pill, the blue pill, or whether I'm in Christopher Nolan's inception at this point. So um, <laughs> you're, in, you're in Ibn Sirin's inception. That's whose inception you're in. <laughs> no, no, absolutely fascinating. This is a you know extraordinary project. I you know I'm still trying to wrap my. I had no idea of you know the, the scope uh, of this. And I'm also trying to sort of figure out. You know, is 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 Heidegger nodding in approval or rolling in his grave that you know, sort of this reconstructing life worlds through technological mediation would would seem to be sort of uh, sort of you know a route that no one would have considered, especially if one is trying to sort of uh, do a run end round onto theologies in particular. So. Um, so you know, I'm I'm really fascinated to see what this produces. But my, I just very quickly, my first question here would be: Is that when you say AI, I mean, are we we do know that machines are not yet thinking and no, they're a tool. It's a tool. They're right. just a tool. So, so uh, one thing I didn't think about that. Yeah, Sorry? just a little, just a little bit about the AI <laughs> yes. aspect so, of the. So one thing I didn't get a chance to talk about here is that the objective of this is not to like sort of anthropomorphize what artificial intelligence is. I'm literally just seeing it as a, a, a technology, a tool, like a tool, the way that, you know, pre-modern Muslims would use an astrolabe to cast a horoscope or the way that you would use, you know, mathematics to do geomancy. This is just another tool. It's a, it, in, our, in our, you know, arsenal of, of tools that we can use to create a community really, right? And so by melding our, our life worlds and our, well, really our dream worlds through this tool, um, we're creating a new reality. That's that's kind of what I'm attempting to do. Um, yeah, I don't think the AI itself, and in fact, I you know I had suggestions in the project like, oh, why don't you name them? Like name the interpreter, name the dreamer. They're not people, they're not anthropomorphized. They, they are just like, you know, a pen or a ruler or a phone or that's it, you know? Um, but very sophisticated tools and ones that I feel like we should be intervening in and, and appropriating. It's also a commentary on the way that, a, that the, when AI is anthropomorphized, it's often racialized in ways mm. that are not remarked upon, right? So by making a Muslim AI, it really gives people pause for thought for a moment. They're like, wait, what, that's not, 
is that offensive or is that revolutionary? I can't tell. And I really like that discomfort that it's causing. Um, so that's also one of the uh, kind of objectives, I guess, to make people feel uncomfortable. Can I, just a quick comment uh -huh. on that. It, it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating, but I, I, um, I just wonder whether it will, and it could have the potential to actually change no, the normative logic or in, in the way that AI sort of is, is currently sort of written, mm. programs are written, et cetera, because the information is coming from a, a, a completely different life world. Um, have you, I mean, have you had thoughts about that? I have, but not being an expert on the technologies myself, I can only sort of theorize about it. But yeah, I mean, in theory, what you do when you dream is you go into another you know, ontological existence, collective reality, and you see that, right? And that's what you experience and live. And to bring that back and enter it into this, you know, tool that's an, a neural network that kind of develops and, you know, new, like basically takes that and kind of just rearranges and reproduces it, right? That, I, I agree. I think that's definitely not what these tools were made for. And I don't know what will come out of it. But yeah, it does play with the very logic of, of why AI exists and what it should be for. Definitely. Whether anyone will notice, I don't know, right? Like maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, a scientists actually working with AI, this will totally fly under their radar. They'll be like, oh, that's some weird little you know, contemporary art, Muslim futurological project and kind of shrug their shoulders. You have really, you have artists doing really interesting stuff with augmented reality, for instance. Um, you know, there's an Iranian artist, I believe her name is Shirin uh, Rahimi, who's doing augmented reality apps where you have a, uh, called Where Are the Female Prophets, right? And, um, you know, forgive me, Shirin, if you're out there and I, I get the title of this wrong, but basically I've been following her work and, Basically, you enter into this augmented reality where you have female geomancers who are divining the future. So this is kind of similar insofar as you are, it is an AI that is divining the future, basically, right? And the claim is not that we are, uh, it's not a representation, right? It's not mimesis. I'm not representing what divining the future is like. I'm actually doing it. Right, I think that's that's the difference that might make it something that challenges the fundamental assumptions of what AI is is, is and, and is doing. So, uh, Najib, you wanna uh, you want to ask any questions? I've got I've got things to say too. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, we in the interest of time, why don't you? Uh, okay. Ask well, ask. first of all, you know, I, I was having hal. Uh, <laughs> as in Hal, uh, first with Arvind's uh, presentation and then with uh, uh, Noor's incredible Islamo futurism, uh, <laughs> if that is a uh, if that is a proper uh, categorization, I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, in tune with uh, you know Afrofuturism naturally, yeah, totally. uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, who could have hoped for more from this panel? What a fantastic <laughs> panel! Uh, thank you both so much uh, for uh, what a miracle of uh, condensation Arvind's uh, presentation was uh, so much uh, in there. Um, so, uh, you know, first of all, about this repairing religion, the title of the panel. Um, uh, so uh, one would hope it's more in the passive sense, uh, uh, right? uh, uh, or rather in the sense of religions. I mean, after all, now we're, we, we're stuck with this category, right? Uh, and uh, this, this is uh, the, uh, the situation we're in with respect to all kinds of different things. Yeah. So we're missing language all the time, thanks to the fact that we have these unusual, uh, you know, uh, unusable really, ultimately. And I think uh, I'm in uh, complete agreement with... Uh, uh, Arvind on that, but uh, as you, you know, a lot of, so a lot of what we teach at Habib, students are like, so how are we supposed to talk to the world outside Habib University after uh, you put us through this? Like, how are you going to talk to the rest of the world? Uh, so, um, uh, so I mean, the, the, the word religion is, is out there, yeah? So uh, repairing religions, not in the sense that we can repair religions, uh, which is the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, you know, crazy, ambitious, 
uh, totally hubristic projects that were undertaken precisely in the wake of this uh, epistemicide, colonial epistemicide. I'm thinking of, uh, I've, I'm citing, of course, uh, Iqbal's early 20th century work. Can you imagine the chutzpah? Huh? Reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, like, I mean, not even a prophet would have attempted such a, and never did, yeah, uh, attempted such a project. So it's not uh, repairing religions, but religions that repair, yeah, I mean, some, um, some, uh, some sense, uh, very little bit of space, yeah, uh, some sense that simultaneously uh, is reparative uh, and uh, signals towards religion in a sense that is different from the way we think the way the word religion is normally used yeah uh, so uh, so one could interpret it that way um so you know for in order so allow me to say two things one you know this uh, colonial epistemicide and this uh, uh post epistemicidal condition in which we uh, in which we live and operate and I completely agree, you know, that we need to move uh, to thought. Yeah, uh, uh, thinking is where we need to uh, where we need to go uh, in this space. Yeah. So for a lot of people, uh, I want to reach out by doing a very very simple exercise. Yeah. So all of us know that in Pakistan, for instance, yeah, over just the past forty years, yeah, less. Uh, people moved from saying Khuda Hafiz, which was in a number of languages, not all languages, but in a number of languages, uh, had been used for centuries on end, yeah, uh, to Allah Hafiz. Uh, and it's precisely because uh, they said, you know, Allah is the Muslim God. Yeah, Khuda is uh, the Persian God, ancient Persian God, uh, and Allah is the Muslim God. Yeah. Uh, now, this is precisely the kind of translation yeah, that, Arvind, you are, uh, you are gesturing towards, together with the creation of religion and uh, world religions. Yeah? So uh, the very idea of a Muslim god, of course, is, uh, runs against the first ayats. No Muslim can, uh, uh, can pray without saying, Alhamdulillah, Rabbul Alameen, yeah, which is, uh, uh, you know, praise be to the Lord of the worlds. But they're saying Lord of Muslims, yeah, Rabbul Muslimin rather than. So, this is something that uh, most Muslims say every day, yeah, uh, if not several times a day. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. They also know that Allah just means God, yeah, they knew this for centuries, yeah, uh, they, they knew that uh, Allah just meant God, yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, this was completely lost. And this is precisely because of this process of translation. I mean, even the word Islami. So now the state of Pakistan, I'm doing this, sorry to take up so much time, but I'm doing this for a wider audience who might uh, to get uh, them to see some of the import of this. Yeah. Um, so the word Islami, for instance, which is in the name of the state of Pakistan, Islami Jamuria Pakistan. Also, you have Iran, which is the Islami Jamuria Iran. Islami... So I was, uh, you know, if you look it up in Platts, which is uh, put together at the end of the 19th century, Islami first means faithful, orthodox, and then it also means a Muslim, a Mohammedan, as the British uh, called us. Yeah? Uh, so it was actually a noun. Yeah, you, there is, Islami today is only an adjective. Once again, I agree with your timeline also, Arvind. It's uh, really just the past century and a half. Yeah, uh, which is the most crucial period. And I think uh, that's the period that uh, uh, Noor is also uh, referenced, yeah, uh, the past 150 years. So the word Islami, from being also a noun, nobody can imagine Islami being a uh, noun today. Islami is only an adjective, yeah, and it is a direct translation of Islamic, right? It's these remarkable, uh, this is precisely what has happened. So for people out there, the fact that Allah becomes a Muslim God, which makes absolutely no theological sense, because Allah, of course, you're supposed to be a monotheistic. So there can't be other gods. Yeah, there can only be <laughs> Allah. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so it makes absolutely no sense. It's utterly incoherent, yet it is utterly prevalent. And it also has nothing to do with their own experience, which is that of reciting 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. How many times the numbers, you know, in a number of days. So this rupture from your own experience, yeah, it's a, this, this very, very simple example uh, for people out there. Yeah. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask is, so, you know, I'm teaching a class on Hana Arendt right now, Hana Arendt and Gandhi. And Arendt is also talking about this profound modern alienation from experience. Yeah. So this alienation from experience, this epistemicide, uh, is actually a, uh, not just a colonial condition, it is a universal condition. People are alienated from their own experience, are unable to make sense of their own experience because these, because of these, uh, you know, really incoherent, really, I'm, I feel this more and more, these incoherent modern concepts like progress, like religion, they're actually incoherent and senseless. Yeah, they don't, uh, the moment you analyze them, uh, for a, a brief period of time, you understand they make no sense. Yeah, uh, that they, they don't even cohere together. Yeah, like for instance, you say people by progress, you say people are living. You know, people are living. These people are living in the past. Muslims are living in the past. Sikhs are living in the past. How can people who are living now be living in the past? What kind of sense does that make? Yeah. So uh, it's co totally incoherent, but you know, utterly prevalent, just like religion. And clearly the gesture, you know, this is this lovely gesture that both of you have made uh, towards philosophy, yeah? Uh, the love of wisdom. I mean, these were deeply philosophical traditions. I think most, I mean, this is not unique to Muslims uh, or uh, Sikhs. I think pre-modern uh, traditions are uh, philosophical, yeah? People are searching for wisdom. Philosophy, that's what it meant, yeah? even in this language, yeah? Uh, the love of wisdom. Now, the love of wisdom, isn't once again, the modern period is a totally anti-philosophical period. I mean, uh, you know, Tocqueville wrote about the Americans and democracy uh, in America, that they're the most anti-philosophical people ever. Yeah, so uh, once again, this uh, destruction of uh, philosophy or the philosophical uh, dimensions of tradition, uh, contemplative aspects of all of our traditions, uh, you know, th this is also true of the West. It's not just true of us. Uh, in the post-colonial world as a result of colonial epistemicide, uh, I think that, uh, that epistemicide uh, or on, ontologicide, right, uh, happened uh, uh, in the West as well. Yeah, it's not as if, uh, uh, you know, uh, people in the Western Academy or people in the West are terribly thoughtful. I mean, this is after all, one of the things that uh, Heidegger was also lamenting is that, uh, you know, uh, we live in the most interesting of times, yet we are not thinking. Yeah, uh, he's saying that, of course, sitting uh, in Germany. So this is a question I have for you: Isn't this a much more a universal condition? I'll hmm. let Arvind uh, take that one. <laughs> That's a huge question. <laughs> It is a huge question. Um, it is, and, and it isn't. So I, I'm just going to sidestep the question a little bit and try to come back to it. <laughs> One of the reasons I, I, I use philosophy is not as an end in itself. It's really a tool to disrupt. Um, and even when I, I talk of thought, and I couldn't make it apparent, in this um, in this talk, is is really to to be on the same kind of playing field. Um, I'm just trying to think this through. Actually, be the the material and the, the the kind of experiential material that that I'm used to using as a, as a kind of inspiration for that is is essentially poetry. And specifically the poetry of the Sikh gurus, which encompasses different life worlds, both Hindu, Muslim, and incorporates a, a, a lot more, and also different languages as well. And the challenge for me is has been how to kind of express some of that in in a way that does some justice to it without um, going through that colonial framing in which you know it, it's routed through religion basically through the category of religion 
And what was interesting, uh, listening to Noor's uh, presentation about dreams and stuff, is that when I touch base with um, ideas that are expressed or, or, or whatever, when I touch base with what people call religion, I've done it through s essentially simple things like my wife's dreams, for example. Um, and her, and the kind of relationship I have with her and the way that that sort of translates back to, to opening up thought in a, in a really weird kind of way. I don't know if I'm making sense here, but what I'm trying to say is that it comes actually from lived experience. And, you know, I'm not doing a top-down project. It's, it's, it's actually a bottom-up. Um, so that, that I just want to clarify that. And I wonder if I could get back to, I'm, I'm trying to sidestep the question still. <laughs> I'm not succeeding, but is it a universal condition? I, I think it is to some extent, um, but we, I think different cultures have experienced it in, in different ways. Um, and I think we have to kind of work our way into it uh, in, in, you know, from different angles. Um, and I'm not doing too well here, but maybe you... So if I go back to that, the, uh, the devastation of a sense of reality, yeah, so we're talking about reality over here, uh, that you see in the West, yeah, hmm. where they think that they're going to, uh, you know, escape to Mars. What could be more insane, yeah? Uh, or what could be a greater detachment from reality? Or to imagine that, you know, they could continue... Uh, to this, th these, uh, these level, this kind of growth, yeah, on a finite planet. That's also total in, uh, insanity, a total disconnect from reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think this, uh, this loss of reality also, yeah, which is also simultaneously with the loss or, uh, or the destruction of experience, as Walter Benjamin called it, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the destruction of experience um, is uh, really now a universal condition. I mean, I think, you know, the, uh, that's why a lot of people in the West, for instance, so on my Facebook also, I've joined a group which posts something from the Stoics every day or Neoplatonists. You know, they're also trying to, uh, you know, uh, reconnect uh, with some sense of reality through these older uh, epistemologies and older ontologies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think what Noman was gesturing at, and I think it, uh, it's really valid, is that this, um, the crisis of religion, the, uh, the impoverishment, uh, you know, that arises from um, a kind of loss of ontology is most is, is actually more prominently felt in the West than it is in other regions. So, in other words, you know, the, the a deprivation of a kind of ontological richness that was there in the past that some of your projects are trying to appropriate mm. and that Noor is trying to recreate uh, that we have lost access to at least, you know, through the medium of writing or the internet, you know, however we access them. Um, that 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 sense of poverty is is much more in, intensified uh, within the West and plays out in uh, sort of the life worlds of capitalism, which, as we see, are you know suicidal, you know, com completely divorced from you know the reality of you know what a life world needs to sustain itself. And I think that was that was that your sense of like you know is this a universal condition? It's not you know so in that sense both the po post colonial and sort of um, Metaphysical impoverishment is is a universal condition, but this this gets me to sort of one question that I wanted to ask, and and it's related to this conversation, and I'm trying to connect it to something that Noor said about how you the the students are the source of theory. That is, in other words, you're asking them to connect directly with their experience of of dreams, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that you know as academics. Uh, we, we are still somehow imprisoned in this representational, you know, that, that our truths have to be powerful at the level of propositional truth, right? I mean, because obviously we're sharing these through text. Truth claims, yeah, exactly. Making truth claims, exactly. Right, making truth claims, and obviously that these have to be expressed in a particular, you know, uh, mm -hmm. series of language games, you know, depending on who you're, you're playing with. Um, 
but that in order, but you know, in order to, I mean, repair religions, we need something like, you, you know, most people are really interested in say the ex in experiences. This is why tourism, for instance, it seems to be, you know, like the hallmark of being modern and consumptive is like, you know, posting images of, you know, I was at, you know, the Taj Mahal or I was at, you know, Barbados or wherever it is. And, and, and I think what draws people to this kinds of, this kind of consumption is of course an experience. Um, and at some level, you know, the, the kind of work that we're doing um, either at the epistemic or the ontological, you know, you know, uh, level, or obviously they're, they're both interrelated, um, lacks this sense of providing. I mean, I mean, the, the truth of what we're trying to point to has to come directly through experience, mm -hmm. right? Or something like, you know, what Charles Diamond calls the pretext or, so, you know, sh short of, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, populating our water supplies with the uh, psilocybin or you know, DMT, uh, yep, you know, that as well. which might kind of yeah. jolt us out of this, um, you know, there are certain limitations to, you know, the... Yeah, so if I could just speak to that for a moment, yeah. I think my answer to this dilemma has been uh, dream interpretation, right? Because, and my, the way that I tried to get, or I would have liked the students to think about it, hopefully they did by the end of their course, um, is that it's, sure, you can travel through the um, intellectual tradition of Al-Ghazali and philosophy and, and the word games and truth claims surrounding dreams and dream interpretation and, and the semiotics of it. But ultimately, what it is, is those are also just tools, right, <clears throat> to recapture and kind of recreate <clears throat> these sort of practices of radical listening, right, and the creation of kind of intimate metaphysical bonds between you and another person. And that was kind of what I saw dream interpretation. And, and I would even say just the vernacular tradition of it, right? Of just listening to each other recount dreams, attempting to understand what they mean and to envision a future emerging out of those dreams and to envision another kind of time space that defies sort of, you know, geotemporal, like spatiotemporal realities. And to, to kind of be in that space together I saw that as being the most valuable aspect of this set of practices for kind of creating an, an, an enriched metaphysical environment that we could actually live in, like in the world, right? And that, and that does away with the need to have to have read, you know, Derrida or Deleuze or Agamben or right, anyone, you can do this with any, anyone, right? You know, anyone can be a source of semiotics or of theory or of metaphysics. Um, and, you know, the, the act of listening carefully and deeply to someone else's dream world, to someone else's life world, um, I thought that's also a radical practice. And so I guess now the translation of it into this like onto technological future is just kind of like, how does that practice translate? Does it, you know? Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that you kind of have recognized that this was an effort to, to kind of recreate that metaphysical richness of a lived experience whilst uh, attempting to escape also the need to build that experience on a scaffolding of kind of, um, you know, Western thought. So, yeah, that's kind of the aim. But yeah, thank you for recognizing that. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we are at the 11.33, just past the mark. I mean, we, and there's just so much more to discuss it. Do you want me to take a couple of questions from um, the web, from from our viewers? Sure. So I, I'll at least just, you know, uh, we've got a couple of questions, but I'll just, um, I guess I'll take one from uh, Afan Aslam. He writes, uh, well, you can perhaps change the input to your AI algorithms and try training models as you wish, but without repairing the internal machinery of classical algorithms, are we really disrupting Western computational logic? That said, the project sounds fascinating. I thought that was <laughs> a, a good, you know, a good question because, um, you know, AI is obviously a language. Yep. Right? A graduate of Habib University, if I may say, computer uh, <laughs> scientist. Yeah, it's a brilliant question. I am not myself a computer scientist, so I welcome the input of computer scientists. Am I disrupting the actual architecture of algorithms? Probably not. I don't know. But if you know how to, please tell me and let's do it. 
That's my only answer. <laughs> You work with the algorithm that you have, right? Not the ones yeah. that you match. <laughs> but I, I'm happily, I would love to actually be able to disrupt the architecture of algorithms or build a new one entirely. So computer scientists in the audience, please get in touch with your um, disruptive ideas. <laughs> okay, unfortunately we've gone uh, over time, but Arvind, do you want to say something? Um, I don't... I haven't got anything major to say, um, but what did come out of the conversation just now um, that we, we were having, I do worry about um, recreating sort of life worlds as bubbles, um, as opposed to undoing or redoing the terms by which we dialogue with the supposed outside. And I, I, for me, that's, that's a, a, a major, and that's what I mean by diasporizing philosophy. And it's not just philosophy, it's everything else. It's, it's, that's just a metaphor for, you know, just, just uh, living life in a, in a system dominated by Western norms, basically. Um, it has to touch whatever we do can no longer be satisfied with living in our life spaces. They have to disrupt in every possible way um, the, the, the normative operations of um, what we understand as capitalist, global, Western life in general, or touch with them. And that, I, I think for me, that's the, that's the aim, how to, how, to, how to interact, encounter, and create some kind of change in the machine itself. And I'm using the word machine, not in, in the AI sense, but in, as the kind of the matrix itself. Um, how does that actually happen? Can we, can we do that? Um, I don't have complete answers for that, but it's something that I'm, I'm sort of working on. This is something that, um, you know, as six have been happy to move away into their own sort of, bubbles basically and work in those but nothing ever changes with that you ultimately have to change the environment that you live in and I, I think that for me that that is the that's the challenge that's can I just add something to that because I really Please. agree with you and it's sure. one of the things that actually bothers me about my own project is the Islamic framing of it so I wanted to have a character that draws on Muslim life worlds and yet mm -hmm. what is a Muslim life world like if you look at you know, pre-partition Punjab, the, the life world was shared, right, mm. between a range of different communities and groups. It wasn't, you know, a Muslim life world overlapped, you know, uh, the, the Venn diagram with the Sikh life world was, was you know, very, uh, there was a lot of shared space and with the Hindu life world. And so my question is now, is it, and I guess the, 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 the turn toward technologies, I would hope would, would work toward diasporizing this impulse because it's this open-ended practice it can hopefully include as well as as kind of defining you know a community it can also because it's open-ended right. right um so i'm actually struggling with how to frame it in that sense right because to me a muslim in the context of this ai project is anyone whose life world has been devastated by colonialism <laughs> right? right so you know it's uh, it can be a lot of, of different people and, and diasporas and, and diasporas in the metropole that you know exist as we discovered uh, in Karachi for instance so um you know how to I think it's a very good point and how to how to do it though is the question right like how to actually execute that that project of recreating a rich life world that's shared but also has its own uh, character. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also fraught with increasing danger because as we are all increasingly mediated through technology uh, and these technological uh, capabilities are of course global and freely available on the cell phone which you know now almost you know so you know when we're all sharing a kind of internet space I mean this radically alters the framework of mediality mm. uh, and anything that you might want to call a life world I mean you know, I mean, kids from Habib are watching the same Netflix shows that 
kids, you know, in India and Brazil. And so, you know, the imaginaries are being shaped by this corporate capitalist dynamic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually choking out the possibilities of any kind of, uh, you know, life world spaces that, you know, that aren't uh, part of this spectacle. So, I mean, you know, just as a cautionary tale that, you know, when we're, when we're gathering all of these dreams, which also reflect the anxieties, um, you know, and dreams of sort of, you know, the, the, the modern capitalist neoliberal subject, um, you know, we risk creating this kind of, uh, I mean, on the one hand, a, a fabulous conversation, but also, I mean, I, I guess I'm not sure what I'm saying, but, you know, that there's a danger there and sort of just simply sort of assuming that dream worlds and life worlds sort of seamlessly map and can map onto each other, you know, and, uh, you know, and at the same time resist the, the, uh, the apparatus, you know. Mm. If, if yeah, I might, I might be creating a dystopian nightmare rather than a utopian dream world. It's very possible. It's very, very possible. Yeah. It, it remains to be seen, in fact. Yeah. Perhaps it's a pure means. Yeah. <laughs> With no teleology, with no end. Uh, it doesn't, end yeah, it doesn't have a teleology, to be honest with you, but like consciously so. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, absolutely scintillating talks, lots to think about, and obviously the work that, uh, that we have cut out for us, both experientially and intellectually, and, you know, in the realm of cognition and thought uh, is massive and daunting. So, but, you know, thanks to warriors like yourself um, and of course many others, um, there's, there's hope. So not for us, but as Noman would have interjected with Kafka, but uh, there's still hope. So um, on that note, I will close unless Noman, you have anything else to say because this is the last of the thematic. I want to really, really thank both of you for those fantastic presentations. Uh, just, I couldn't have dreamt uh, for a better panel. Speaking of dreaming, yeah, <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank Keep you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for the audience uh, mm -hmm. who are listening in for staying tuned. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of the questions here. There was there were a couple more, but we are unfortunately way over time. So thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you.